Is this Sony RX10 Mark IV the best all-round camera ever made? I think it is, but let's have a look at it. Welcome back to my channel. Today I will review a camera that I have owned for about a year. I bought the, the Mark I version of this camera in 2015 to be my main camera on a trip to Iceland, shooting both images and video. It was a great camera on that trip. The images uh, depict the extreme contrast of uh, the Icelandic nature pretty well. I might have uh, gotten slightly more popping images using my full frame Nikon D800, but apart from being very heavy in itself, I would also have needed a heavy assortment of lenses and uh, on top of that a separate video camera because the D800 is not that good for video. In total I was very pleased with the images and uh, the robustness of the camera, weather sealed as it is. But apart from this uh, trip, I didn't really click uh, with this uh, in my daily life and on more, more normal trips within Europe where I go in my car and can carry a more device load of photographic equipment. Some years later, while I was sponsored by Fujifilm for my uh, attempts on Everest without oxygen, uh, without oxygen bottles, I tried a real super zoom camera, Fujifilm FindePix uh, S1, with a zoom range of 24 to 1200 millimeters in full frame equivalents. On a trip to the Annapurna range in Nepal, uh, this camera provided me with some images that I didn't quite expect. I was once again convinced that uh, for extreme telephoto shots uh, I could uh, make do with uh, less ambitious uh, equipment than um, a full frame or a medium uh, format camera and a huge uh, 600 mm or even longer lens. By the way, you can see the review of the Fujifilm FindePix S1 and more images from my uh, up there. Fast forward to 2023 where I wanted to invest in a long telephoto lens without the bulk of a full frame version. I came across a good offer on the newer Mark IV version of the Sony RX10 that I used on the trip to Iceland in 2015. And I decided to try it out. Now this camera has stayed with me for around a year and I'm not going to part with it this time. But why is that? Objectively, uh, the Mark I version had some things going for it compared uh, to the Mark IV. The lens uh, of the original is a constant f2.8 all the way from 24mm to its maximum reach of 200mm uh, um, full frame equivalents. That's awesome when shooting video uh, and it's uh, much lighter than the newer version. I'll put some data on it uh, up here. The original also had the built-in ND filter, which for some reasons is lacking in this camera. Again, that's a nice feature for the videographer, but uh, also nice if you want to smooth the water, like on many of the waterfalls in, on Iceland. But the Mark IV has uh, improved on all other parameters. The lens has an awesome reach of 24 to 600 mm in full frame terms. That is a whopping 25 times optical zoom. The aperture is not constant through that zoom range, but is a 2.4 better at the wide end and is an even more respectful f4 at 600 mm. The electronic viewfinder in the original was not impressive, but the Mark IV version sports a resolution of almost 2.4 megapixel. Uh, giving you a really sharp framing of your subject. Now that we are talking pixels, the sensor has the same 20 megapixels uh, resolution as the first uh, version, but 
It uh, uses stacked backside illuminated photosites, allowing for much better low light performance and uh, faster readout and thus uh, also less rolling shutter. Furthermore, the autofocus is uh, faster, much faster, and even for sports and wildlife photography, it is uh, quite usable, especially as it is supported by a fast shooting rate of 24 frames per second. Turning our attention to video, Sony has gone from Full HD in the original to 4K in this version, and there are some uh, impressive slow motion settings uh, of up to 660, nine, oh, sorry, 960 frames per second. Image stabilization also works pretty well. The optical uh, image stabilizer in this camera would give you uh, four and a half stops of uh, uh, stabilization. And that is just uh, one caveat. The stabilizer doesn't work in 4K mode. So for video in 4K, it's not good. I would have liked a fully flippable LCD screen as uh, that would make it possible to bring only this camera for both photography, video and vlogging. It has a microphone input and even a headphone output, so the video part of the camera is uh, really something. The images coming out of this camera are, despite its relatively small uh, one inch uh, sensor, quite astonishing. And I have come to like this camera very much uh, despite my um, Hasselblad uh, medium format obsession that you followers on this channel probably know about. To conclude this uh, review, I must say that this camera is going to accompany on many trips as it has a fair bit of everything that I need. And it does it, all these things uh, pretty well, leaving me with both nice images as well as uh, very nice uh, video. Despite that it's a camera from 2017, it's still heck of a camera. I can only recommend it if, you, uh, if your needs are for a very capable and very versatile camera. 
I'll be doing reviews of some older Super Zoom cameras in the future, so stay tuned to that by subscribing to my channel and please also hit the like button. Thank you very much for this time and bye for now.